Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see everybody in. My goodness, we, we got a nice group for this afternoon. And uh, for those of you in the studio, you can be turning to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14, as we have it on the board. And uh, for those of you watching out in television, we'd just like to welcome you to our class. And as we've had so many of you write or call, you feel like you're a part of it, and that's exactly what we want. We want you to feel that you're in a classroom environment. We're not preaching at anybody. This is not a revival as such. We're just simply a Bible study. And uh, I always like to remind folks, I'm just a layman. I'm not highly educated or anything like that, but we trust the Lord has seen fit to use us by His grace. And all we ask is that you compare Scripture with Scripture. I've always stressed uh, you don't have to agree with me on every single point. Uh, you have that freedom as believers in grace to search the scriptures on your own. And uh, that's why I say, if you don't agree with me on every jot and tittle, that's, that's perfectly legitimate. But when it comes to the fundamentals, I will not compromise. I mean, after all, we have certain absolutes in scripture as well as even in our secular uh, world. All right, I think uh, maybe it wouldn't hurt to remind folks that all our past programs are available in uh, either the video or the little books or the audio cassette tapes. And if you're interested in any of those materials, you call us or drop us a note in the mail and we'll get right back to it. Again, I have to thank my television audience for your letters, for your prayers, and for your financial support. We just appreciate every bit of it so much. Okay, now for those of you here in the studio, I will go right into 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And remember in these previous verses, Paul has been talking about his view of the prophetic scriptures. And we covered that quite extensively in our last few programs, how that Paul describes the Antichrist to a T in accordance with the Old Testament prophecies as well as the book of Revelation. But now then he comes on into verse 13. We're going to start teaching from 14, but let's pick up the flow in verse 13 where he writes that we are bound to give thanks always to God for you. Now again, I always have to stop and remind people. What were these Thessalonian believers just a short while back? Pagans, idolaters, and nothing of any knowledge of the God of Scripture. So never forget that. All right, and so this is why the, uh, Paul is so thankful for them because of what they had come out from. And so he says, We're thankful always to God for you, brethren, because beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit and the belief of the truth. Now, Paul uses that word truth quite extensively throughout his letters. And uh, it's certainly a far better usage than what most people do with the word today. Today, truth is almost held up for scorn. But the Apostle Paul is constantly bringing us back to truth. Now, uh, I probably could take you back. We won't take time to look at it. But you remember in John's Gospel, it says that the law came by Moses and the prophets, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And, of course, I've always stressed in my teaching that you can almost interchange the name Jesus and the word truth, and you'll never do violence to Scripture, simply because Christ is truth, and truth is Jesus Christ. All right, so the very truth, then, that Paul is certainly referring to here is the gospel as he proclaimed it, Paul's gospel. And I guess I can never exhaust it. I, uh, I feel as though I can't do it any too often. So let's come back and, and just look for a second at how Paul uses the gospel of truth. Come back to 1 Corinthians again, chapter 15, verses that we've used over and over now these past several years, because there is no clearer place in Scripture for the delineation of the gospel for us today. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. All got it? 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. 
And uh, remember now that the Apostle Paul is dealing here with a Gentile congregation down there in southern Greece. And he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, see, which I preached unto you and which also you have received and wherein you stand. And now we're going to be looking at that word stand a little more in depth after a bit. And verse 2, by which, that is by Paul's gospel, by which also you are saved. If you keep in memory what I've preached unto you, lest you believe in vain. In other words, you have to know what his gospel is. Now verse 3, and here it is. Plain as English can make it. For I delivered unto you first of all. There weren't any forerunners of the Apostle Paul as John the Baptist was with Jesus. There was not an advanced company to come into Corinth and get the city ready for the coming of this great evangelist. But no, here he came as just a servant of God, proclaiming nothing but Christ crucified and risen from the dead. And so here it is. I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. In other words, the same thing that saved him. How that? Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, I had someone ask me the other day, does it actually say in the Old Testament that Christ would be three days and three nights in the tomb? And I said, no, not that I'm aware of, but it was certainly back there in type, and uh, Paul or Peter quoted David out of the Psalms that Christ would be put to death, he would be buried, and he would be raised from the dead. But it doesn't just specifically say that I'm aware of that it would be three days and three nights, although it was certainly pictured in various types. All right, now then come back with me to Ephesians, and we'll pick up this same connotation. Ephesians chapter 1, and dropping down to verse 13. Ephesians 1, 13. I'm constantly being reminded by the television audience, don't go so fast. I can't keep up with you. So I've got to purposely slow down a little bit and let you have time to find this. But in Ephesians chapter 1, and we drop down to verse 13, where the in whom, of course, is referring to Christ in verse 12, in whom you also trusted. Now, how many times have I said it on the program and in my classes that Paul always addresses only one class of people? Who are they? The believer. He never addresses himself to the unbeliever. And that's why he uses this language then, in whom you trusted, these believers. And of course, it's directed as well to us today. All right, so in whom you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth. There's that word again. Well, what's he referring to? The gospel of your salvation. And we just read it. So what's the truth? That Christ died, was buried, and rose from the dead. And that's our salvation when we believe it, see? All right, so that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and then in whom also, that is the core of our gospel, Jesus the Christ, in whom also after you believed, nothing else. Always remember what the Bible does not say just as well as what it doesn't say. He doesn't say after you were baptized or after you did this or after you did that. No, there's only one stipulation. After you what? Believe. See? God only looks for one thing in a human being to start with, and what is it? Faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. That has to be the first stepping stone. Now, other things can follow, but when it comes to our initial salvation experience, it has to be based on our believing or our faith in what God has said, and what God has said is based on what he has done. Plain enough? All right, so he says, after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You don't do anything for that. 
It's an automatic part of our salvation that we are sealed with and filled with then the Holy Spirit of promise. All right, now then, let me back you up a little ways because uh, I probably don't emphasize this verse as much as I should. Come back with me to Romans chapter 2, down to verse 16. And again, you have no idea how many people have said less. I've never seen this verse before. And if one says it, I imagine there are hundreds in the same boat. Romans chapter 2, verse 16. Wait till you find it. Romans chapter 2, verse 16. All got it? In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to what? My gospel. In other words, humanity is going to stand before God one day and they're going to be judged with what they did with Paul's gospel of grace that Christ died, was buried, and rose from the dead. Now, of course, I'm sure that that has to take place from the time of the church on. We're not dealing with the Old Testament economy here. But once Paul's gospel was proclaimed, that will be the basis of God's judging men's eternal destiny. All right, another one while we're still in Romans that I think very few people are even aware it's in here. I've said it over and over as long as I've been teaching. How many sermons have you heard on Romans 16, verse 25? Romans 16, verse 25. How many times have you ever heard anybody allude to it? Not often. It's just one of those verses that is so loaded that I think people are afraid to touch it. Romans 16, verse 25. Romans 16, verse 25. Now to him, Paul writes, that is of the power to establish you according to what again? My gospel, that Christ died, was buried, and rose from the dead. And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to, not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but according to what? The revelation of the mystery, which was given, of course, to the Apostle Paul, but according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret, in other words, no one else ever contemplated that God would be going to the whole human race outside of Israel with this tremendous gospel of grace. And that's the revelation of the mystery, but it's been kept secret since the world or the ages began. And so this is why I have for the last However long we've been in Paul's epistles, been stressing over and over Paul's epistles because he is the apostle of Gentile, he is the apostle of the church age, he is the apostle of grace. And I had a lady write again just yesterday. She said, I'm among all those you are referring to. She said, I was always told to just ignore Paul's epistles, that all we needed was Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, she's legion. But remember, the devil likes nothing better than to use the Scripture to deceive people. That, that's his ace in the hole. Using Scripture to deceive the masses. And he's an expert at it. And so we do not ignore Paul's epistles. Rather, we make them preeminent and not to the exclusion of all the rest of Scripture. No way. But here is where we have to come to the very core of our belief. All right, back to 2 Thessalonians then, if you will, chapter 2. And now we can go again into verse 14, and I've probably covered a good portion of it because it's all tied together that when we have a belief of the truth, we have a belief of Paul's gospel. Verse 14, whereunto, back in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14, 
whereunto he called you by our gospel. See how he's con and that's by the Holy Spirit's inspiration. This is not an egotistical man. This is a man that has been so humbled by all of the trials and tribulations he went through, he doesn't take credit for anything. But the Spirit has led him to write the very things that he writes, and it is Paul's gospel, see? Whereunto, verse 14 again, now he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now again, you have to remember that Christ in his earthly ministry was certainly not epitomized as the glory of God until his resurrection. At resurrection, he showed forth all the power and the glory of the Godhead. And that was not revealed then, of course, until we get to this apostle who now puts it out as his gospel or that which we must believe. All right, now then let's go into verse 15. Therefore, because he has now made his gospel so plain that it's based on what Christ accomplished at the cross, it's based on the power of his resurrection, therefore, brethren, see, he talks to believers, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or by our epistle. Now you know Paul condemns traditions, and I always do, and yet the Spirit has seen fit to use the word here. But he's not talking about the traditions of the fathers or the past. He's talking about that which he had now been teaching these new believers fresh out of paganism. And now verse 15 again, he says, stand fast. In another place it says, don't be blown about with every wind of doctrine, but we have to plant our feet down and stand fast in the truth and hold to these things which Paul says they had been taught, or in our own particular time, that which we have been taught from, of course, Paul's epistles. Now then it goes on, whether he says by word, or our epistle. Now, it's, it's good, I think, to remind ourselves once in a while of some of the time factors. You want to remember that Paul probably began his ministry out amongst the Gentiles around 40 A.D., when he went on up first to Tarsus in the Cilician Valley, and then when he came back to Antioch and helped Barnabas and began that ministry there. All right, that's 40 A.D. Now, he doesn't write his first letter, which is probably the Th Thessalonian letters, until about 58 A.D. So how many years have these, been, these new believers been out there without any printed instruction? 18 years. That's a long time. So what did they have to depend on? Gifted men. They didn't have the printed page. And they didn't have... A, a great organization as such, but they had to depend on these men who had the gift of prophecy, which of course we see back in 1 Corinthians 14, and that's why Paul called the gift of prophecy the most important of the gifts, because it was the only thing that kept these people together. Now again, remember that the term prophecy in our New Testament out of the Greek does not mean telling the future like those who had prophecy in the Old Testament. See, when Jeremiah could, uh, by prophecy, give the name of Cyrus a hundred and some years before he was born, that was prophesying. That was telling the future. But that's not what the word means here in our New Testament. It simply means to speak forth the truth, the word of God. And so this is why the apostle now then is using this term that these people had been taught First, of course, by the word of gifted men, and not only just Paul and Silas and Barnabas and Timothy and Titus, there were probably other men who were able to carry on the things by the work of the Holy Spirit. And then he says, or our epistle. Now, when Paul speaks of his own epistles, you know, I'm always reminded of Peter. Now, if you'll go back with me all the way to 2 Peter chapter 3. And I'm using this verse constantly when people say, well, my Sunday school teacher says that Paul shouldn't even be in our Bible. 
I'm not going to go by what Paul says. I'm going to go by what Jesus says. You don't have any idea how often we hear that. But now look what Peter himself writes at the end of his life. I think he's in prison in Rome about the same time that Paul is. They're both martyred, I think, within a matter of weeks under old Nero's premiership. And now look what Peter writes. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. My, if that doesn't put all the arguments to rest, I don't know what does. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Look what he says. And account or understand that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom, what's that? The revelation of the mysteries, and according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you. Now you see, Peter doesn't tell his, his readers to go back to John, go back what I said, Peter. He doesn't go back and say, well, now look what Jesus said. No, what does he tell him? You go to the epistles of Paul. I told one of my Oklahoma classes just the other night, you know, when the Lord was here in his earthly ministry and the Jews were confronting him about questions, I think it was concerning divorce and immorality. Do you remember what the Lord's answer was? You have Moses. Well, what was the stipulation? Go check it out. Moses had all the answers. You've got his reading, writings. Go read it. If the Lord were to come into the room today and you were to confront him with questions, you know what I think he'd say? You've got Paul. You've got all the epistles. That's all you need. I think the answer would still be the same. All right, so Peter says now, you go to the epistles of Paul if you want the truth for salvation. And I've pointed it out before. He could have said, well, remember what Jesus said. Remember what John said. But he doesn't. He says, you go to the epistles of Paul. And then verse 16 is another confirmation of the scripturalness of Paul's epistles. As also in all his epistles, not just the one written to Jews, which is Hebrews, but in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. Does that seem hard to understand that a man like Peter says something? No, because Peter was steeped in Judaism. Peter was steeped in legalism. Peter was steeped in the Old Testament format that everything that had been prophesied was coming down the pipe and that after the tribulation had run its course, Christ had returned and set up his kingdom, and Israel would go into the kingdom. And Peter had no concept that God was going to intervene for 2,000 years and go to the Gentiles and call out what we now know as the body of Christ. And so it was. It was hard for Peter to comprehend this whole change in the format that God had originally laid out for the nation of Israel. Israel. All right, reading on in verse 16 now then. And so in these epistles are some things hard for Peter to understand, and which they who are unlearned and unstable twist, as they do also the other scriptures. And then look what the condemnation is to people who twist the scriptures. What is it? Their destruction. Their own destruction. In fact, now the verse that comes to mind is back to Galatians. Let's come back to Galatians. Chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. And I'll tell you what, this is hard language. This is nothing to fool around with. And that's why I pray daily, and especially on the morning before we come up to taping, Lord, keep me from error. Let me never teach anything that isn't truth. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm the only one that's got all the right answers, but that on the basic fundamentals, I can stay straight as an arrow on the truth. Because look at the responsibility for people who twist the Scriptures. Galatians chapter 1, starting at verse 6, where Paul writes to these people who were being conned into going back under legalism. And he says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him who called you into the grace 
of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. In other words, it wasn't something clear out from the blue that was unrecognizable. No, it wasn't that totally different. It's not another. But he said there'd be some that would trouble you and would what? Pervert the gospel of Christ. And you know what a perversion is. It's when you take something genuine and you adulterate it. Paul uses the same analogy in, in Corinthians where he wasn't like the hucksters who would take good wine and water it down with water and sell it for the same price. See, that's a perversion of a good product. He doesn't do that. But he says, for those who would pervert the gospel, what's their, what's their end? Let him be accursed. The other word in the Greek is anathema. Let them be anathema. And in the English, it's even stronger yet. And it's implied that they are condemned for preaching a perversion of the truth. All right, now in the couple minutes we have left, let's come back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And so we are to stand fast in the truth. And we are to adhere to Paul's epistles. Now, never misunderstand me. We don't throw away any of the rest of the Bible. It all fits. And that's why my whole series of teaching for the last many years has been from Genesis all the way through. And it all fits. But for us Gentiles under the age of grace, Paul is the one that he himself says we are to follow. All right, now then, verse 16. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father. Now you see, that's the whole Godhead. That's the whole Godhead who hath loved us, hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through keeping the law? No, through what? Through grace, through God's unmerited favor. Now when we get to Titus chapter 2, somewhere down the road, we're going to be looking at how do we live? How do we behave under grace? Well, grace is not license. Grace is that unmerited favor of God that had been poured out without our doing anything to deserve it. But it also means that when under grace, we're going to be under God's leading. We're going to be prompted to live in a life that's pleasing in God's sight. Just because we're free is not license. But oh, the grace of God that has set us free from legalism and the law. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.